I'm Pete Kirkpatrick. I'm the chief hardware architect for Pure, I'm responsible for all the hardware platforms. Today we're uh, very excited to focus on the Flasher AC, um, which what we think is kind of taking us into a new era. So, you know, I love uh, stealing pictures from the internet, so uh, I thought this one was good. We, we actually do listen to people. Um, we love our customers and we have a lot of forums where we're either listening to customer feedback in a group, uh, like a customer advisory board, or maybe we're sitting down with customers in a briefing session or just the best uh, feedback comes from when we're working through problems with them. They tell us exactly what they need and usually the discussion becomes very frank. And this, the feedback that led to this product was very consistent over years and wide groups of customers and, and everybody really told us the same thing. The short version is we love Pure, we love what applying Pure to our tier one environment has done for us. Um, either it's performance, it's storage efficiency, it's available, uh, creating a new workflow that wasn't possible before with some of the data mobility and protection features but they just wanted to apply the same goodness to their tier two. And so there's obviously an economic aspect of that and that's a lot of what we're gonna talk about today. Um, but really, they wanted to realize that benefit so they could really get the, the same effect that they've seen in tier one. So what were they complaining about? So it, it's funny that, you know, Tier two can be a huge environment at some of these customers, right? So tier one can get a lot of focus. It's running some very critical applications. Um, but tier two being so-called cheaper, but so big, it can become actually a huge problem, right? So they, they end up with lots of silos because they're kind of piecing together solutions here and there. And that leads to complexity just in trying to tie everything back together. So they can't get a simple view of what they even have. They're interfacing to all these disparate systems and trying to stitch everything together is a real pain. Um, one of the assumptions in tier two is that performance is really not what you should be going for. But in, this, in, in the environment today, it's really gone kind of to the extreme. It's not that you shouldn't expect high performance, but it's almost like an all bets are off kind of thing where you get no expectations for what, to, what you're going to get. And so the tail latency that comes from having hard drive in the system in any place means that ultimately, you know, you're going to have very, very long tail latencies. Um, so, you know, the flash array, bringing that to all flash is kind of a straightforward way to say, hey, you know, the performance isn't going to be the same as you expect from, say, a flash array X, but it's going to be fantastic when you compare it to a hybrid or a, or a hard drive based system. And then just the general notion of being enterprise class. Uh, is my system going to stay online? Again, tier two shouldn't really have to suffer from being crappy, to, you know, excuse my French. But um, we really want to be able to provide this experience where the array is available, the hardware is built with quality components and, and uh, you know, stays running. You can keep it running with non-disruptive upgrades. And then on the business side, we can apply programs like our Evergreen to keep the, the, the investment uh, returning. So our solution to that is the Flasher AC. Uh, we do believe it's really the industry's first uh, capacity optimized array. So it's certainly not the first Flash array because we already built that. But um, this is the first one to really address these issues that customers are seeing in tier two. So a little bit more about what it is. Um, we've really focused on optimizing around QLC. I want to address right up front that the first arrays that we'll ship, and you'll see this when we show the capacities, you'll recognize some of the capacities, those are TLC-based drives. But the opportunity is really driven by QLC. And so we really optimized around QLC and working with all the limitations of QLC, but exposing them in traditional pure fashion in, a, in an enterprise class manner. So you can see that some of the latency is gonna inevitably bleed through because the media is very slow. I'll go into details about you know, what we see at the media level. But a two to four millisecond latency, but very, very consistent. So again, that's, that's gonna beat the pants off any hard drive based system, but on the tail latency, it's gonna start to look orders of magnitude better. Um, so we think that's actually, you know, we try to frame things in a positive light. That's gonna be fantastic compared to uh, the competition. 
And there's a tease here about you know up to five petabytes. That's an effective number. So you can really put a lot of information in the system. And the the combination we think is going to be great for consolidating <laughs> workloads off of hybrid and and uh, uh, hard drive arrays. So again, you know, QLC was really one of the main themes here. We really optimized around uh, accommodating the wear characteristic of QLC as well as the performance characteristic. And that's kind of the, the details, uh, the technical portion of the talk. We'll really focus on that. Um, but you can also expect to have the same kind of uh, warranty and programs that Pure provides, so Forever Flash and things like this. It's in our best interest, as well as the customer's best interest, to keep this array online and healthy and away from uh, you know, the, the failure zone toward the end of life. And in that vein, it's a flash array. So we've set a very high expectation for flash array. Uh, it's expected to be available. It's got you know, the extreme simplicity, uh, cloud-based management with Pure One, and all of the, basically all the benefits, including interoperability with Flash Array, so uh, snapshot-based replication and some of the other features, again, I'll go into, to make sure that we're really expanding this portfolio but keeping everything tied together. Um, and then the capacities. So you can see here, effective, just to be, if it's not clear, everybody uses different terms. You know, raw are kind of the number of bits that you're buying. Um, usable is typically, we take away system overhead, we have to do some RAID and, and uh, system space for metadata and so forth. But then effective grows again because that's after data reduction. So this is our kind of typical, we, we have all the same data reduction algorithms running in the, in the Flash Array C that we have in Flash Array X. Um, so, of course, everything varies upon the workload, but the ability to achieve the same data reduction is all built in here. And so this is very exciting. Um, the density here is pretty extreme. This is our, our same chassis, so it's the 3U chassis. So we're getting a petabyte in 3U, which is really phenomenal. Okay, so we have a lot of material about the use cases. You'll see more if you go to some of the other sessions at Accelerate. Here I just want to kind of touch on them um, so that we can spend more time on the underlying <laughs> technology. But some of, the, some of the straightforward use cases are, uh, you know, not every, not every V1, uh, VM deserves to be in kind of the performance tier. The performance tier naturally comes with a, a higher cost and higher expectation. But a lot of VMs just, uh, you know, need some space and they don't have to have such a high SLA on, on performance. So a lot of the, um, you know, automated uh, provisioning uh, within uh, vSphere can be used to kind of set the VMs and, and uh, auto-provision those into the tier where they belong. We've got a really rich set of, of data protection, disaster recovery, backup scenarios that we can support. So again, the snapshot-based replication can really tie things together. Can you replicate multiple flash axes to one flash C? Yes, absolutely. So that fan-in use fan case, yeah. we expect that. Both in the data protection as well as this test dev kind of environment, <clears throat> we expect to have, uh, in some cases, you could end up with a fairly high fan-in ratio. So, of course, the key will be balancing the total ingest rate and the capacity in that, in that uh, capacity tier. Um, These are uh, SAS or SATA connected? Yes. Uh, the media here, the, everything will be 100% NVMe. So, no. Or even the QLC disk. Absolutely. And so for scalability, we're talking about still NVMe. Um, all of the same protocols on the front end will be supported. So out the front, you can still use uh, fiber channel, iSCSI, or NVMe fabrics. It's funny because fabrics is relatively new, and that's uh, one of our main beta customers was their flat out requirement. After testing FlashRay X with N NVMe Rocky, became uh, it was robust, uh, fortunately, and become a new de facto standard at some of our large customers. In the back end, I'll get into it. This is all based on direct flash. So it's our, our internally developed NVMe drives um, with all the direct flash technology. And what I'll try to show you later is that's actually critical to even getting this to work and certainly getting it to work in an economic fashion. So I have a question on scalability. You said that uh, the, the largest capacity effective is 5.2 petabytes. Does this scale beyond that? You, can we add more uh, C-series modules to, to scale further beyond the 5.2 petabytes? 
To scale larger than... Yeah. Well, this is the limit today. So okay. essentially what you're going to see is that when we introduce QLC, we do expect that to be next year, that the, all these densities will increase okay. pretty significantly. Mm -hmm. So you'll see a larger total, a larger raw, larger effective at the high end, but you'll also see a higher density in every one of these okay. modules. Mm -hmm. Yep. So Back to Ray's point, the, both the data protection scenarios and the test ed scenarios can accommodate a fan in. So we do have uh, customers doing uh, all of these scenarios between X's today. So what's the policy-based VM tiering? Is that at a uh, high vSphere level, or is that something that you guys are doing? Or Yeah, I think um, I would think of it as a vSphere function. Folks that might know a little bit more about uh, some of the provisioning. So it's almost like a storage policy control at at vSphere. Yeah. It supports vVols and all that stuff, I guess, right? Yep. It strikes me that a lot of my customers might see this as tier one. Well, we hope so. <laughs> um, I mean, even in you, lieu of. Are you going to publish performance data on uh, this? I, in this presentation, you're going to talk about performance? Well, I gave you the, the, main, um, the main point is you should expect significantly higher latency, right? So. What we see as differentiating tier one and tier two in terms of performance is primarily the, the latency characteristic. Um, what does significantly higher mean, though? Um, depends on your point of view. If you really, um, like you know, two hundred milliseconds to three hundred milliseconds, or now microseconds. I mean, no. So you know, we're talking about on the on the previous talk, we're talking about you know approaching hundred microseconds, and here we're we're already talking memory, milliseconds. Right? Yeah, we were going from two hundred down to one hundred. So this goes from like two hundred up to like three hundred. No, up to like two to four. No, to, um, into the two to four milliseconds. Was multi millisecond range. Yeah. So it is. Yeah, that is significant. Okay. I want to dive into the QLC, which is really the the technical gist here. Is that this stuff is awful. It's it's really awful, and so. We did our best to kind of smooth everything, you know, take off the rough edges, but um, some of that performance characteristic uh, comes right out the front end and, and uh, everybody gets to share the... It's like a tape drive. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, so we thought that this level, you know, three milliseconds compared to what anything you're going to get off a spinning disk is spectacular, right? So I think that's the way to look at it. If you're, if you're in that environment, you're going to look at this as a huge improvement. I don't think folks are going to look and say, wow, you know, I really want to put my transactional database here, and then it's going to actually look the opposite. It'll look slow. I think, I think slow. capacity optimized storage has historically been bandwidth driven. Mm -hmm. So do you have any bandwidth numbers for this solution? Um, I don't have any numbers here, but I can, I, I can say generally um, the throughput is good. Um, good. You shouldn't, you shouldn't exp <laughs> <laughs> Nice metric, huh? <laughs> it's it's not the same as a flash array. It's about so the same bandwidth as flash array. It's not the same as a flash array. X. Oh, okay. um, it's in the same ballpark, but inherently you shouldn't expect to have the same IOPS per terabyte. It's it is yeah, lower, so that's what we think is another. Not exactly the same. I heard you could throw a direct memory cache in there and make it just as. That was the other choice. I love that point. <laughs> um, <clears throat> where did I, where do I, okay, I'm going to get into economics and I'll come back to that. Um, yeah. This is a cartoon. Um, I think it's a good <laughs> cartoon, but I want to make sure it's not, uh, this is, if you get the analyst data from the, your favorite analyst and or you uh, collect this from the archives on the internet, so you'll kind of find the same trend. Um, I wanted to abstract it a bit so we don't dive into a rat hole on too many details, but I think everybody will find the same trend as, you know, a few years back, it was just no matter what flash solution you find, it's going to be more expensive. So way back in, in, in this part of history, there were folks that were especially uh, interested in performance, and they were able to turn that performance back into dollars, and they selectively put flash in their environment, most of what we call tier zero, and that made sense for folks because the cost would come back uh, as a return on their business. You know, there were other folks in that period that were forward-looking and kind of recognized. They're also what we call TCO <coughs> benefits. So there's a lot of costs in terms of um, data center space, rack space, power, cooling, and that list can go on and on into kind of probably diminishing returns territory. But 
leading up to the transition where things are actually cheaper, folks are recognizing these operational benefits and the, the total cost of ownership kind of calculation. But once that mainstream SSD crossed over the 15K hard drive, people stopped buying the old the 15K performance hard drives altogether. Okay, so we've already seen folks uh, in what we would classify as tier two starting to switch over, but it's the very tip and it's because they do recognize all of these other benefits, um, like the TCO type arguments. But what we see is that uh, we're, we're, we're on the precipice here of this change where folks are really gonna start jumping in in a big way. So we think the next several years is gonna be the conversion of tier two over to all flash. Let's get together uh, periodically and see if uh, this prediction bears out. It hasn't hit. So I should point out here that um, with data reduction, it's obviously gonna take the orange line and move it down. And so folks are still uh, building systems out of 7.2K drives. Those are still more cost effective, but given the limited ability to apply data reduction in those environments, we're also very close to um, you know, taking out the bottom tier. It's gonna take a few more years to, to, to make the transition complete. I was at one S storage field day event and somebody said it was, this was the end of disk altogether. I said it was? The end of disk. I think of it as the beginning of the end, but. Beginning of the end. <laughs> I, I, I do this projection quite a bit, and you know, those, those the 7.2K drives are, are pretty cheap, but there's data reduction, there's the cost of everything else in the system, kind of common. There's a lot of factors that actually bring this to be very close together. And I've seen a few analysis like this, everybody does it a little differently in the, in the press, um, and so I think there's kind of building momentum around this idea that it's finally time to switch over. You could afford to lose money on every one, just make it up in volume. <laughs> haven't talked at all about PLC. Uh, in my conversation with our vendors on PLC, it's, it's a development tool. Um, though what they tell me is it's a good way to study the characteristics and make QLC and TLC better. Um, <laughs> which probably leads me into, oh, it's coming up. We're going to dive into QLC here. So, so for a period... There was, a, there was a way to kind of bridge the economics and, and to kind of bring it forward into you know, a, a reasonable performance level. I'm trying to be kind. Um, but hybrid was a way to provide these you know, very large multi-petabyte kind of data sets and claw some performance back by combining it with, with some amount of flash, either a tier up in the front end or a cache. And uh, I think what folks have found is that uh, the performance isn't great um, you, you have a very small amount of cash in relative size to the total array. And so you really do suffer in the performance realm here. And then just the visual is probably enough to show you, you know, comment on the, the real estate, the power, the cooling, and so forth. The vendor visual is I actually, I really like that part. <laughs> it's easy. The story kind of tells itself here. So this is something that we're very proud of. Again, we, we're excited to go and compete in this space because um, we expect folks are going to really like the new characteristic they get. Okay, so finally getting to QLC. So Mayank showed this, and it really underpins the, the overall trend that we're doing. We're taking, I think of Flash Array uh, as starting in kind of the sweet spot, right? It's what most people in the enterprise needed to cover their, their tier one needs. We didn't go after the hero numbers first, and we didn't go after the bulk data first, but we're kind of expanding our footprint. And so uh, the, the DRAM-like performance and cost of SCM is enabling us to, to take on the, the performance workloads like we, we talked through in the cache presentation. But obviously QLC is at the other end of the spectrum and is able to help us out with the economics. You can see the slide got uh, uh, a bit there, but reliability and performance is what suffers uh, as you move uh, down the axis here. So I wanted to touch back on, on somebody mentioned, uh, should we combine these two technologies together? And I'm surprised at how often that comes up. It's a lot of people intuitively think that you should combine these, but I think the point here is they're actually on opposite ends of the spectrum. If you do a real quick exercise and you take QLC economics, you mix in a few percent uh, SCM economics, and you have TLC economics. I think that works over a pretty broad set of assumptions. And so um, I vehemently disagree that combining those two things is a good idea. 
We'll probably do it some way, and then I'll have to explain why. <laughs> <laughs> and today, well, at least you're shipping. vehement about it, right? That's right. <laughs> today, you're shipping TLC. What's that? Flash Array X shipping TLC. Is that what? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and that's the that's the mainstream X. And so that that's actually the perfect um, segue here. So there are a lot of horrible things about QLC. Um, we thrive on this kind of stuff. We study this every day, and we work to mitigate it. I'm just going to talk about some of the the two uh, major major implications: uh, performance and endurance. And as everybody here knows, performance is not just one metric. There's read, write, throughput, uh, latency. But I think looking at the write latency is representative of performance for QLC. And you can really see, you know, back in SLC was never really used in, say, a storage array, right? It's, it's used in EPROMs. It's probably used by NASA and SpaceX and folks like that. But um, MLC was really about, what, 12 years ago now or so, was really the beginning of storage converting to Flash. And so at that time, uh, the latency looked fantastic. And the endurance also was, was reasonable, right? And so folks could... Find a, find a balance there where they could provide this huge leap in performance and they could make it reliable enough. And then TLC came along, and if you remember back at that time, we thought TLC was going to be a nightmare, it's never going never to work, and, and uh, you know, maybe it would only be relegated to certain applications. But now a few years back, um, thanks to you know, breakthroughs like we've had in, in, in managing Flash well, We've been able to bring TLC into the mainstream, and we've been able to make you know this 3K-like endurance last uh, in in a significant way. So that does take some special tricks, um, both in how you you know data reduction can play a, a huge role. If it's in line, you can prevent uh, writes from hitting the media, uh, as well as just how you care and feed your SSDs or or your flash in your environment. But now QLC has come along, and you can see the trend is not to just incrementally drop. There's a cliff here. So performance really fell off a cliff. Um, at the same time, endurance, it's, it's not as much of a cliff, but it's getting into the danger zone where it's not good enough anymore. So it really, really takes special care to make a reasonable system out of QLC. Okay, so everybody that's, that's uh, seen my talks before know that I, I love data, so um, I had to put something of a chart up here. I wanted to dive into write amplification a bit. So uh, a lot of folks know, so uh, bear with me if I explain for folks that haven't been exposed to this before, but in a storage system, um, every time the user writes some data, inside the system we may have to write that data down, and we may have to write it down again for redundancy and protection. We may write a little metadata down to remember where we wrote the data down, and etc. Over time, uh, if there's internal retention in the flash or overwrites, uh, garbage collection starts to happen, um, there's a lot of reasons why that data may need to be written more often. And the ratio of how many times we write internally to how many times the, the user writes is known as write amplification. So it's the, it's the killer in these kind of systems, especially if you want to go and use this really low endurance media. So what I'm showing here is kind of a scatter plot. Uh, there's two colors. The, the first two people I showed this plot to were colorblind. Great. <laughs> <clears throat> Sorry, I apologize, I think about 15% of folks are going to have the same kind of issue. Um, so the upper cloud and the, the fit uh, in so the green line. Right amplification go down as right throughput goes up. Interesting, right? Seems like it should be different. So uh, inline and locality matters there. Um, and so uh, it's this fantastic characteristic. If you push an array to the very limit, you'll get the opposite effect. But people don't operate in that regime, right? So we do have throttling and things like that if you're really trying to run a benchmark or something. But in the field, and this is a mantra at Pure, we optimize for what people do, and we don't optimize for hitting benchmarks and, and hero kind of numbers. So this is a characteristic that I think is very, very rare in technology, and we're obviously very proud of it. So how, you can how see how that... Can, how can write amplification actually be less than one? It's like you're teeing these up for me. So, <laughs> <laughs> some of these are hard to see, but you can, uh, Ray's pointing out that, that 1.0 is here. And so with purity and using the off-the-shelf SSDs, 
we're dealing with garbage collection at the system level and any rewrites we have to do there as well as garbage collection in the drives. But to our advantage, we have inline deduplication, we have compression, mm -hmm. and those are fighting back the other way. So that's some of the reasons besides just the, the flat out economics that we really, really optimize on those technologies. And then, you know, the care and feeding of the SSD, we can groom the data and, and uh, schedule the data um, to be written, uh, written and read from SSD in a way that minimizes its internal garbage collection. So two years ago now, three years ago, we introduced Direct Flash. And Direct Flash, uh, one of the core benefits is that it reduces the write amplification within uh, the SSD level to exactly 1.0. So we get another factor of roughly three on average um, from even our careful use of commodity SSDs. And the combination of, of purity now with direct flash, roughly 10x advantage over what you'd call, you know, plugging an SSD into a legacy system. And, you know, other folks that are in the modern era are starting to figure out some of these tricks and they'll land somewhere in between on that spectrum. But we really believe this technology is key in, in optimizing the lifetime of a QLC based. So I, I'm not sure if I heard that before, but are you using uh, uh, direct flash modules with QLC yeah. into that? Okay. Yep. So you're using the, the same concept as uh, global uh, cache, I mean, um, global flash, um, forget the name of that thing. Yes. Um, so um, in, in Flash Array X, we, we do support uh, off the shelf SSDs, SATA based SSDs, um, and a SAS link mm -hmm. back to the controllers. Okay. We also support our direct flash NVMe based drives. Okay. Um, the, the cache that Steve presented is, is NVMe, the Optane is NVMe connected. Mm -hmm. So we have all the ability to plug in basically any drive that exists into the mm -hmm. array. But uh, this technology is going to be based solely on the direct flash module. Okay. So that's probably a good, good place to point out. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're not the first to deliver QLC, but we do, do believe there's a really significant difference between what we're doing here and what's been done so far. And so to date, what you've seen is um, QLC-based SSDs. And if you really read the spec, they're trying at least to target TLC replacements. And so to get there, what they have to do is they have to over-provision those drives to prevent some of these kind of issues. There's a lot of factors, but the, the theme uniting all those factors is if you're overcoming all those factors, you're adding cost. Again, the point is cost here. We're, we want to we wanna bring the cost down as much as possible so we have a meaningful contribution to this tier two problem. Um, and if we just build it back up with SEM or over-provisioning or DRAM or whatever it takes to compensate, we actually didn't achieve the goal. So I think that's what folks that are delivering off-the-shelf uh, SSDs based on QLC are doing today. So maybe they can grab the press release for being the first, but I don't think they've solved the important problem. So to kind of summarize the, the, the view on um, you know, endurance, so the way to read this is, is um, depending on what type of technology you have, you're going you're gonna to be able to um, support a certain lifetime array. You could do this exercise in three or four lines of Excel. Just assume some reasonable sizes, some reasonable ingest rates, what you consider a reasonable type of lifetime, and you'll come up with something like this. And to achieve you know, this type of array on the different various NAND technologies, you need to be below the line. Um, it's kind of a limbo kind of contest. And so this is where we believe that this technology is really essential to, to meeting the, the QLC limitations. Okay, so another, another way we think we're going to be okay at this is that this is actually a photo from our Pure One headquarters um, where we monitor the data of, of all of our customers' arrays and we do a lot of data analysis. So uh, Pure One Meta is, is running a lot of analysis. Some of them are just based on, you know, let's do our proactive support. Let's try to get ahead of problems. Some of it is what we use more in the architecture is to observe what we're doing, the characteristics of the, of the flash, of the system. We're correlating factors like performance and, and endurance and all these kind of things so that we can really tell if our algorithms are effective. And so uh, oh, NAND they, management is a whole class of, of algorithms that we run. Prior slide. Go ahead. Can I ask you to go back to the prior slide for a second? Mm -hmm. So 
this is depicting, so like the purity with direct flash, this is what any SSD in a pure uh, flash array X would expect its lifetime of X overwrites to be. Is that what you're saying? Um, it's a summary. So what you'll find is there's a distribution, right? So yeah, yeah. there's so this a is somewhat capacities and some 80 people. 80 percent worst case or 90 percent worst. 99.9 percent .9 worst case. It's it's uh, it's got some nines in it. Yeah. I, what I like to do is so the bottom line here, a lot of this does just fundamentally come back to quality and economics, so simple principles. So. Other people have tried to emulate our guarantees around, say, forever flash. Like, if your flash wears out, we'll replace it. That's what we do. Uh, we're very <laughs> proud of that. Others have done it. If they don't make their arrays last very long, there's a cost. Though they said, oh, well, they said they'll replace it. You know, they're getting that cost back somehow, right? So economics is, you know, there's kind of no free lunch. So we take it very seriously that we're going to guarantee to our customers that we'll keep their array healthy, we'll keep it online, we'll keep it uh, youthful. But we're not foolish enough to say, well, then let's go and let them wear out every year because ultimately that's going to be a cost to the company and that's a burden we're going to have to share with the customer. So we do put a big effort into making the underlying media last as long as possible for our own shared self-interest. Um, and the other side benefit of that is um, reliability, right? Staying away from the characteristic you get at end of life is the best way to avoid error scenarios and errors starting to build up and so forth. Which is one of the types of things we analyze when we look at our, at our field data sets. So I think the easiest way to emphasize this point, um, you know, everybody takes phone home data. Hopefully they're, they're looking at, you know, uh, the, the results they get. But if you have a big fleet of commodity drives, like we do, um, some folks are, are really cool about uh, publishing their fleet-wide data, and we, we analyze that as well. Um, you can kind of get a failure rate. You can say, I've got a million drives, and you know, 1% of them fail over a certain year. So you can kind of get very bulk, average kind of statistics. And then you know, each one kind of has a gas gauge. So you can say, well, these drives are 50% left, and Let's watch over the next year. We'll have to replace them. That very coarse kind of statistics. What we do is we monitor every block of every drive uh, in every array, and we do real-time analysis on all of those. Of course, we do offline analysis as well. And so we have a much, much deeper insight into how the flash is behaving um, within the context of the arrays. And so this is really exciting. Um, especially as an architect, to be able to get those insights and to say, well, you know, the trends that we predicted on MLC and TLC are either not true or, oh, yeah, we got it right and, and it's behaving the way we expect. Both of those are good news and they help us course correct over time and, and get the, the next gen right. And so we do actually have QLC deployed internally. We take phone home data on our internal arrays just like we do from customers. And so we're able to do the first QLC arrays in this kind of environment and, and again, compare to our expectations. Okay, so this is the real technical detail here that Ray's looking for. <laughs> it should be pretty clear that performance optimized means low latency, it's high throughput, and um, naturally the, uh, the, the arrays are not as large. In a capacity optimized array, you're going to see higher latency. Um, so I thought the truck analogy was was good. It's it's higher latency than it is jumping in your car and driving down to the corner store. Uh, it's probably something you're going to do when you want to drive, you know, around the city or you want to drive to the neighboring city. But it's very different still than loading up a container, sending that container down to the port, sending that across the ocean. So that's all a kind of a latency analogy. Um, and you can really see, you know, it's, it's this thing in the middle. So if the economics of the two on the right are starting to compete, I think uh, it's, it's going to be an easy battle. And as we mentioned earlier, and Mayank pointed out, is the Flash Array C is a Flash Array. So it's part of the Flash Array family. Uh, it's going to have a lot of uh, interoperability that it can do. Um, you can take snapshots on the Flash Array X. You can offload those to the Flash Array C. Uh, that really allows you to have a much richer uh, set of data protection flows, test and dev flows. And you can start to retain more of those if you want to have lots of different test and dev scenarios. You can, you can now afford to retain those before um, compared to what you could do before. Um, you know, these are going to work off-site. Both arrays are going to work with Cloud Block Store. 
they're going to work with CloudSnap. And so the, the, we had a diagram of all the possible ways you could, you could uh, connect these arrays together, and it was kind of like spaghetti. So I took it out here for simplicity. But we will have sessions that talk about how to uh, build up some of these environments. And again, we're going to have customers come in and, and show you what they're doing to kind of realize the different benefits. So how does, how does Evergreen work today, and how will it work with Flash Array C? Um, the general idea is that uh, when you're on support, we're going to guarantee that your, your media stays healthy, that your, your array is not wearing out. And then um, sometimes there are uh, component upgrades and things that are available. And, and each array and each kind of uh, level of support has different details. Um, the spirit is the same here, where we're going to keep the array healthy, we're going to be monitoring, and we're going to keep it under, um, under support the whole time. But when Flash Array C starts to ship, it'll be TLC SSD? Yes. Yeah, and so in that sense, um, when we do ship QLC, you'll be able to add QLC to the old array. Oh, in addition? You'll be able to do, um, you'll be able to do upgrades from, from TLC to QLC wholesale. Um, not obvious why somebody would want to do that, but you can. And so, it'll again, the spirit is to provide that seamless environment where we don't want to, you know, we don't want you to get stuck. And it's not the intent of Pure to ship QLC on Flash Array X? Um, it's not at this point. Um, I think our goal, again, was to, was to expand the, the range. We tie things together, and we think that um, the mobility that we're providing is, is, a, is a good way to do that. I do think uh, eventually, maybe it's in the out years, that we, that we can combine those within one environment. But just like you can find two arrays, to, to be able to combine two uh, within the system, I think, will be pretty straightforward. It's just not what we're doing today. So I flashed this up here. This is actually something we're really excited about. Um, we're going to put file support on this thing. So a lot of folks, when they do hear Tier 2, they think, wow, you know, large, um, sometimes slow, and often uh, file support. And so we heard that loud and clear. A lot of our customers agree. Um, what we're going to do is not only put file support on the Flash Array C, but we're going to put it on the entire Flash Array family. Then we have unified uh, uh, block and, and file storage. We've got coverage of the, of the kind of tier one uh, business applications as well as tier two. And of course, this fits in with FlashBlade being the, the, the way to get really high performance file object. If you want to do more parallel workloads, if you have, you guys know about FlashBlade, but it really, really shines in a lot of these environments that are, you know, scientific computing, uh, analytics, uh, AI, machine learning. And so we're really trying to get complete coverage of the space uh, with this announcement. And I think that's what we had for today. You dropped that bomb on us and like, we're done here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No more Can't questions. I dropped my mic, I think, but. <laughs> um, does NVMe over Fabric work in NFS and SMB or? Um, How does that not together? a direct combination, <laughs> but there there are concepts like NFS over RDMA. Um, they're NFS less popular. They've actually RDMA. been around for maybe ten years. Um, they're just less popular. Um, so I think folks in in that environment are willing to set up uh, you know the network that way. You can have some benefits. You can have compute offload. You can have faster faster results. Um, so it exists. Uh, we don't support it today. Um, and honestly, we don't get a ton of uh, uh, requests from customers. Uh, but we look at it, so I think we'll be ready um, if that kind of comes up. And you, uh, is available today? Uh, tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so for file support coming in 2020, we're talking like Q4, 31 December 2020? Uh, if we didn't do it by then, we'd be lying. So the, the, the goal is to have it, uh, hopefully it's well before then, but you know, this, this is the way we, we make And just promises. a purity update, suddenly it's like, oh, I've got this available. Yep. Kind of thing. Yep. It'll be in a release. Of course, it'll be non-destructive, and, you're gonna and you'll, you'll be able to take advantage of the new block. Mm. Are you going to partition the storage between block and file, or are you going to have it all integrated together? Or? I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> um, at the end of the day, it's, you know, 
It's it's the storage oh, you have in the array. Flash, I understand that. I can't see us providing access to. Well, I mean, it doesn't really make sense to access files and and access them in a block. So I think in that sense, it'll be partitioned. Like you can have your your file systems and you can have your block space. I mean, space. the question is, you're going to say 20% of my array is file, 80% is block, or 100% can be used for both. But you got to carve, a, you gotta carve a volume up for. Oh, it. certainly 100% could be used for both. After you decide, there's Are no. Are you going to partition or not? I think yes. Okay. It's just not going to. We're not going to go out and say it's half and half. <laughs> but you can't access the same bits through both protocols. But I don't think yeah, that's even I, possible. But can you access the same bits through NFS and SMB? Yes, of course, yeah. And it'll do that kind of map. I'm th just thinking Inter of the net app side of things, that. you know, when it do goes and does that mapping of the Active Directory account to the underlying uh, uh, POSIX version of it or something like that. As far as I, as far as I know. So <laughs> I mean, the question is the partition something that's Nebulous, or is it something that's fixed? So I, as a customer, say, I'm going to take 10% take and allocate it to file and 90% to block, and forevermore on this system, that's the way it's going to be. Or is it something that says, I can use 100% of this for file or block and change the percentages on a, on a daily basis? I, th I think so. That's, that's what I would expect. <laughs> I, I think, I think that you is, can, it really comes down to, in, in, you could provision so much space in this, so long it's as it's all zeros. Provision. So long as it's all zeros, exactly. It's all yeah. thin provision, so long as you've got enough space. And then later, if you want to shift back, certainly. You know, if you want to, if you want to delete volumes and, and put more file systems, you certainly. You can shrink what's going to be the, uh, the file part of the file system, but you can't shrink the block part of the file system. Unless you're done with it. Yeah. If you're going to use it, you better keep it in, yeah. So um, sounds like we have a call for a deep dive on our file offer. That would be the next story. Yes. Uh, and uh, we'll certainly have other people that know well, more about that than I do. And back so to we'll, one of your let's, slides. Let's set that up. Army, set it up. <laughs> Steve, back to one of your slides. You had tier one, tier two apps. You had you know, DR backup and archiving, cloud. There was something yep. in the middle called Edge. What What's sort that? of solution do you have for Edge? Edge. What, what was that? Was cool. Array. Block storage for you for the. It's edge. just a flash array X, it's just not flash, flash array dot dash e. Yeah, I don't think like there's that. much <laughs> fluff around that. It's just it, it works well for that use case. 